really like my chocolate with a little bit of salt, so it'd be like a chocolate and a chip and a chocolate and a chip. And before you know it, I'd be 400 pounds right here on camera. <laughs> and the camera adds weight as well. My self-esteem would be dropping. Oh, careful, honey. Well, everybody, I hope you can see the lovely Almost Houndstooth quilt. This is the uh, one that Sheila pieced for us in the Yes, Please fabrics with this gray dot background. So I am pretty excited to get it quilted today and hang it up on the wall. So I'm going to be going through the whole process of loading this quilt here in front of you. And then Dylan will come up and give us a hand with the uh, quilting portion of it because I don't use Quilt Path often enough to just confidently come in here and finish up this quilt. This thing seems to be pulling on you, honey. Maybe that will help a little bit. So those of you that have been following along, I hope you've already got the pattern. If you are just joining us, then of course you can go visit our website at sparrowquiltco.com and you can download the free Almost Houndstooth pattern. You're just gonna click on that banner with my face and it will take you to a page where you can input your email address and then we will reply with an email with the pattern attached. And you can also use up some of your stash and make this quick and easy quilt. I think the first time I made this one, uh, I cut it out one day and then I pieced it the next. When I got this idea in my mind, I was on fire and I just uh, got it all together quite quickly. Uh, I've told the story before of why it's almost houndstooth instead of regular houndstooth. Normally we would have another little triangle up here of the matching print and uh, I got to that point and I decided that no, I wasn't going to do that because it seemed like a lot of work. So <laughs> I um, left those little squares out and I've got a stack of them at home somewhere. But if you look carefully, you can see that the gray sections are a true hound's tooth. So almost hound's tooth is why we've named it that. I've got all three layers uh, laid out here today. Uh, it's very important to me to lay out the three layers first to ensure that everything fits. There is nothing more frustrating uh, than getting to the end of a quilt and you're about six inches from the end and you realize I do not have enough backing fabric. And once you've already got your quilt on the frame here, it's not easy to get your backing longer. Uh, it can be kind of ninja pieced on the frame. Uh, aside from that, we've got to pull it off the frame, bring it over to the sewing machine and add another strip. Then it's always just a PETA and that stands for pain in the but and um, no one wants to do that so I really do highly recommend making sure that your backing and your batting are bigger than your quilt top by at least four inches on all four sides so this quilt measures up at 66 by 66 I have cut my backing at 74 and I think my batting is even bigger than that I would much rather see it too big than barely big enough therefore we've got plenty of space to load the quilt and make sure that everything goes as planned. So once I've got my quilt all laid out and I can see that everything is big enough, then I like to fold it a certain way and then I can load it on without a lot of thought or preparation. Um, I'm really bad with keeping the numbers in my head. So if I measure this and I know that it's 66 inches wide, um, I'm not going to remember that when I go to load it on the frame. So I want to make sure that I've got it folded in such a way that I can just unfold it and carry on with the job I'm doing. Now, everybody, how is the sound? Does everything sound okay? Can you hear me well? We've got some extra machines. I'm really close to uh, our renter that we've got up here today. She's working hard. She's here all day yesterday. She's going to be here all day today. She's pounding out quilts. She drove in from like two and a half hours away. She really, really gets a lot done. I'm really proud of this girl. Hard worker. And where are you all watching from today? Pardon my? Okay, good. Sound is good. I'm glad to hear that. So tell me where you're all watching from today. Does anybody have any big Valentine's Day plans? I'm hoping to take my boy out for dinner later, but don't tell him. Oh, wait, he's probably listening. Maddie, love you. Want to go out and eat later? Eating is good. 
So this quilt seems appropriate for today. We've got some cute little hearts in there and there's dots and there's plaids and there's Cupid arrows. So we are going to quilt a heart type design on it. It is called Pieces of My Heart and you will get to see that a little bit later. Now, everybody, don't forget to share this video because today's prize is gonna be really good. So we're gonna change things up just a little bit today. When you share the video, you're also gonna tag a friend who you would also like to win a prize with you. So we're giving away a prize for you and a friend today, okay? So when you share the video, you're gonna tag your best friend who's also a quilter and you're both gonna win machine quilting services. Won't that be nice? So we're gonna share the love, spread the love. You're gonna share this video. If you don't know how to do that, look under the video there on Facebook. You have the option to like, comment, and share. So just go ahead and share, and then you can type some um, a post at the top, and that's where you're gonna tag your friend. And if we select you, then both of you are going to win. So that's a really great prize today, and I hope that you will all go ahead and do that. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and start folding this up. Um, how I usually start is that I've already decided that this is the top edge of my quilt. So I'm gonna fold everything across the width, and then that way when I bring it back to the frame, I just have to unfold across the width. And I don't have to remember any numbers, um, any orientation, it's already arranged for me. I hope that makes sense, and you'll see me doing it here. If you've got any questions, please ask them in the comments. Uh, Landon, my oldest daughter, is here. She's my little producer, and she shares all your comments with me. So uh, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it, and we'll do our best to answer it, okay? So y'all are kind of getting a free class today because I teach this. Well, not me anymore, usually Dylan now. This is how we teach our renters to prepare their quilts and how to load things on the frame. So... Um, yeah, you all get to take advantage of that today. I usually fold until it's about the width of a hanger. Most quilts come in here on hangers and we hang them on hangers. And we're just gonna fold it over onto itself. So I know when I come back, I'll just toss this over and open it up across the width. And that way I don't have to think because you all know that I have that fruit fly brain and sometimes I just lose track of what I'm trying to do. So. I try to make things as easy for myself as possible. Now I'm folding my batting across the width as well. And when I opened up my batting across the frame, I made sure that the right side of the batting was up. Did you all know that batting has a right and a wrong side? Some people are surprised when I tell them that. So you can see right here, there's a big crease from where the batting was on the roll, on the bolt. Um, when it's folded together, those are the wrong sides touching each other. It's just like fabric. The right sides of the batting are facing out. So I opened it up like this, and I put the wrong side down towards my backing fabric. Sometimes it's really hard to tell what's the right or the wrong side. So there's different um, identifying features about batting. The right side will typically have kind of a dimpled surface. Batting is manufactured through a process called needle punching, where they, you know, they pound through it with uh, hundreds or thousands of needles, and um, that makes all the fibers stick together. And so on the right side of the batting, it creates a dimpled um, appearance. And on the wrong side of the batting, you get these little nubs or little bumps, and that is the wrong side, where the needle has exited. This camera set up here. Is it split there? So I'm going to try and hold this up here for you. And hopefully you can kind of see. Can you see well? You see all those little nubs? That's the wrong side of the batting, and that's where the needle has exited. So sometimes though, you'll be looking at your batting and you can't see a dimpled side and you cannot see 
a, I call this the pimpled side. So I'm going to show my dimples up towards my quilt top. I'm going to hide my pimples down towards my quilt backing, you know, kind of like when you're a teenager. If you cannot see any of those identifying features, something else that you can look for is little brown flecks. There's a batting called Warm and Natural, and it's got little brown flecks in the batting, and that is just unbleached um, plant matter. That is the right side, and you would put that dirty side, they call that, up towards your quilt top. Now let's say you can't find any dimples, no pimples, or any dirty side. What you can do is take a pin and poke through your batting. You're going to get a little bit of resistance on one side, and I want you to put that resistance down towards the quilt backing. We want our needle to puncture through in the easiest way possible. If you're using like a big fat polyester or a wool batting, there's not really any right or wrong side, and so you can use that either way up. If you are putting together like a patchwork of batting, you want to do that pin test and make sure that the resistance is down on all the pieces that you're joining together, because we tend to get a real mix of things in um, our scrap bin. And there might even be mixes of different kinds in there, but um, you can use them all together as long as they all go the same way. And if they're not, it's not the end of the world. It's just a recommendation. But what can happen is you can get um, bearding on the back of your quilts, like little tufts of batting that are sticking out the back side of your quilt. And it's typically because the batting was in there upside down. Now, I should not have taken this off, but I was too busy yapping. So I'm going to just load it fresh. Uh, right from the start. All right, so like I said, I folded this all across the width, and um, you can see there's no right or wrong side, like a uh, right way up on this backing. It's just dots. So there's nothing that determines this needs to go up or down or sideways or whatever. So we're just going to load it on. I'm going to throw that across the frame, and I'm just going to start opening it up. Now I'm going to begin loading with the front roller here, so I'm going to put all my bulk to the back side. And the first thing I need to do is lengthen my front roller and I'm going to reach into the frame and bring it over onto itself. Now I also have a video on YouTube and it's called How to Use a Long Arm Quilting Machine. So if you own a long arm or you have a friend that's got a long arm and maybe they're just not sure how to get going, that's a really good video um, that teaches you how to start using your machine. And it just starts with everything I've just shown you now, how to prepare your quilt and then how to load it onto the frame and how to follow a pantograph. We won't be following the pantograph physically today, but the computer will drive the machine for us. So that's pretty handy. We could stand here and eat chocolate while the quilting gets done for us. I like to load my backing so that I've got a finger width past this front dowel. And we use a system called leader grips. So to load this quilt onto the frame, I'm going to use this clear plastic channel and it's just going to pop over uh, the dowel that's already sewn into the canvas and that just traps the backing between those two layers and clamps it in place for me. We used to pin and that takes a long time and you catch your fingers and you catch your belly and you always end up with these war wounds and now I call that cave quilting. I think I'm so funny. Once I've got that fully attached, I'm going to drop that into the frame and I'm going to start loading it, rolling it on. How are we doing? Have we got questions or anything, miss? Nope. Is anybody there? Good. <laughs> okay. Huh? Just me. That's okay. I think I'm awesome. So, I've really got a lot of tension on the fabric. 
I like that. I want it to roll on here as smooth as possible. I'm already trying to prevent pleats, tucks, and wrinkles. We've talked about that before. I've yet to meet a quilter who likes pleats, tucks, or wrinkles, so we always do our best to make sure that our backing fabric is really nice and smooth and therefore avoiding any messes on the back. I will roll a full roll, roll and a half, and then I'll smooth out from center. And you perhaps can see a couple of little wrinkles in the fabric there. They flatten out as I go. It's not uh, anything I'm worried about. This fabric is straight off the bolt. I did press it a little bit downstairs, but I'm not uh, too, too worried about it, having wrinkles and stuff. I'm just gonna continue rolling and smoothing. So, being as we're giving away a prize of machine quilting, I want to know how many unfinished quilts you've got waiting to be finished. How many do I have? So I've probably got at least two or three downstairs. I'm going to estimate about ten. Been getting a little bit better at finishing lately. I think this uh, Stash Busters program has been helpful. The question Landon just said is, do we sell leader grips? And yes, we do. You can find them at sparrowquiltco.com. Just, sorry? The link is in the comments. Good. Okay. So now that that has happened, that that top edge has fallen off, now I'm going to make this top roller long, just like I did at the beginning. Now this is a cool feature that our machines have. Um, it is a motorized fabric advance. So this back roller is controlled with a motor. Pardon me. And I just use the pedals on the floor here to lengthen and shorten the roller. Thank you, Landon. And then we just Fold it over, there's kind of a sweet spot, just over the crest. And I really like it when the dowel is right there. It's really easy for me to attach it in that spot. So now I will take this edge and I will put it back up there. And again, I'm looking for about a finger width past the dowel. A little bit of a flaw in the fabric there. Two unfinished, one nine, two, 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 three. Wow, guys, I'm impressed. Uh, 30 plus. 30 plus. There we go. <laughs> two waiting for quilting, two waiting for quilting, and four quilt tops. All right, I'm just going to duck around back. Thanks, Dylan. All right. So now at this point, um, I want to make sure that the fabric is still fairly square. And um, I want to do that by keeping this surface as flat as possible. If I were to take it and skew it even a quarter of an inch, you can see that draping that immediately begins to happen. That tells me that my fabric is not square. So I'm always just reading the fabric, making sure that it's laying nice and flat. And... This swoop here is called the belly. And it's hard to say, do I have the same amount of belly on this side as I do on that side? Is its depth the same? So if I just bring it up flat like this, then I don't have to worry about that swoop being equal all the way across. Are there any measurement margins on the No, there are not. Um, I know some people do mark center of everything and I have just found over time that that center doesn't stay accurate this this leader this canvas it's fabric it stretches it pulls it gets more use in the center than it does on the edges so that center marking after a point is no longer accurate so I don't rely on that to ensure my squareness I'd rather read the fabric and um, use that as my cue Oh, 
Okay, so that's fully attached. Now I'm going to drop that into the frame. This is a cotton backing, and it's got little dots on it. Um, if this quilt had been a little bit smaller, I probably would have used Fireside. I really, really do like Fireside on the backs. Um, and that brings up a t good question. What's your favorite type of backing fabric? I, um, I have a lot of flannel downstairs. We could have used flannel, but I think I kind of, um, I really liked these dots. And it felt like it was kind of modern, like it suited the quilt. So I went with that route. But I'm always curious what other people like to use. So I'm using my motorized advance now and I'm just picking up all that slack. My goal at this point is just to get that leader grip past the white leveler bar. Because that leader grip is, you know, quarter, three eighths of an inch thick. I don't want it to be under here. What would happen is that the machine would get hung up on that thickness underneath the leveler bar and the, um, the throw plate here on the machine would actually catch and hinder the machine from moving smoothly. And um, we don't want to mess up the design. So it's better to put that leader grip just out of the way. My quilting will actually start about here. So now you can see why I need that extra four inches on all four sides. Well, at least the top and bottom is what you can see. At the sides, it just gives us a nice safe buffer um, to make sure that your quilt gets quilted up nicely. I hope you've all remembered to share the video. Um, it'd be nice for you and a friend to get some quilts quilted up. So all you're gonna do is share the video and when you share it, you're going to tag the friend that you would like to share a machine quilting prize with. And if you win, we'll just sell, send you the um, details of where you can send your quilt and all that good stuff. Okay. So I'm just going to tuck all that extra under the table. I can see that I'm fairly straight across the top. And then I kind of smooth it along this front roller. And then I'm going to grab this top edge and bring it towards myself and stuff it under this bar. And then I can lay that all back out again. The batting I'm using today is uh, Hobbs 8020. It is just a nice warm batting, very versatile. You could use it for most anything. I can't think of any reason not to use Hobbs. It's such a great batting. It's very uh, sturdy, it's very, vers like, very versatile. Um, I move quickly, I'm impatient. When I tug and pull on it, it's got a nice elasticity, it just bounces back. Uh, I find that cotton is a very linty and two not very sturdy and when I abuse it like that and pull it and tug it it stretches and it doesn't bounce back so I really like the Hobbs for that because it uh, holds up to my abuse a lot like Matt after 24 years he holds up to my abuse Andrea agrees. Did you say? Nice. Not yet. No, not yet. Um, I have to get myself organized to do that. And we will, um, if I don't film it later today, then we'll film it tomorrow for sure. But I'm hoping to get that done later today. We're thinking about maybe doing it at the end of the stream, but I am a little bit unprepared and I don't like keep, keeping you guys hanging while I get myself organized. So I have got a widespread hand and a widespread hand of extra fabric on both sides. So I'm just kind of centering it 
doesn't matter to me if it is bang in the middle. Sometimes quilters have a seam um, and they want their quilt centered right over that seam. And that um, is fairly easy to do. It's the horizontal seams that are hard to line up with. It takes a little bit more um, figuring out. It's not as easy to center um, a backing seam on the long arm as it is when you are domestic quilting, because when you're domestic quilting, you're basting everything out or basting everything together and you can plan exactly where it's all gonna land. But with the long arm, it's not quite as easy. We can do it if we have to, but it's not, not convenient, nor is it fun. Take some mathing. Now I am always um, comparing one of my horizontal seams to my rollers, I know my rollers are perfectly straight. So if I can see that my seam is straight in comparison to my roller, then I know that it's probably good to continue loading it. If my seam is wonky like that, then I need to straighten it before I put it under that bar. Once the quilt top is onto the batting, things are harder to move around. So I wanna do any adjustments before I stuff my quilt top under that last bar. Again, I kind of smooth along that front roller and I'm gonna grab this top edge, bring it towards myself and stuff it back under that bar. Now that's as far back as the machine can go. And I can see, pardon me, that my quilt needs to come forward just a little bit so that I'll be able to stitch along that top edge. I always baste the outer edge of the quilt to ensure that everything stays where I want it to. Um, it would be really frustrating to be quilting and have something like that happen, you know, it, we're paying attention at all times, but if I were doing this by pantograph and I were standing at the back, I'm not gonna have a direct sight line to what's going on. When we're doing the computer on the quilts, we see everything and we are very careful with it. This would never happen, but that's just an example of how things can go wrong. And that's the reason that we base the edges of our quilts. So I'm gonna scoot it down towards me just a little bit because I don't want the machine dragging on this roller. As you can see, it has happened in the past and it just makes it not pretty anymore. We could probably fix that up with a little bit of um, paint. I think you can use paint from um, you know, paint small cars, model cars. That's the words I'm trying to think of. We could probably touch that up, but it's just aesthetics, it, it still functions perfectly. So today we are using the uh, APQS Lucy and uh, she's my favorite machine, I love her. And it is outfitted with the quilt path, so the, com the quilting is gonna be automated um, in a bit. One of the fellows will come over here and will help us with setting up the pattern. And um, the machine will just be automatically driven and we will just supervise to make sure that everything goes as planned. Now, what I wanna do is make sure that I have loaded this nice and straight. So I've lined up the front of the hopping foot with this inside seam. And I'm just gonna drift across the table to ensure that uh, it is straight. Do you need some thread from over here? <laughs> Get in there. <laughs> so this young man you see with us here is Dylan. He runs our uh, long arm quilting department up here and supervises our renters along with my brother, Bob, who you will probably also see in a few minutes here. But I am just drifting across and when this seam goes higher than the front of my hopping foot, I'm just gonna kind of drag it down a little bit. If the seam goes lower, then I need to tug my quilt back up. And this tells me that the quilt is straight 
before I begin. If I don't straighten it before I start, then it will always be uh, crooked on its backing. Not that anybody might notice that, but we may as well put in our best effort to get it as straight as we can. All right, so I'm just bringing it down a smidge. Good, that looks really good. Now you can kind of see this excess fabric that I've already, that I've shuffled, and I'm just going to smooth it all out. All right. So I have pre-chosen a couple of threads. You can probably see better down at this end, hey? Am I? Okay. So this one is called light gray and it is nice. Okay. This one's nice. It's a little bit silvery. We would see that. This one is called chestnut and it's really close to that rose gold that is in the quilt. Uh, I'm fairly certain that's the one I'm going to go with. Here we've got another one called mercury. It's a very gray, silvery, kind of bluey. I'm going to try a darker gray too, just for kicks. It's not bad, but it's kind of blah. It's not very exciting at all. I think I like the chestnut the best. I had kind of decided that ahead of time. So I'm just going to get these three grays out the way and we will go ahead and load that chestnut thread onto the back side. I love these glide spools because they have this um, bottom ridge that pops down and then I can just lay the thread end into that little groove and then I just pop it closed and it really keeps the thread quite neat and tidy which we all know is a good thing because thread can get a little unruly. Good, yay. It's always good when I don't feel like I'm out to lunch. Out in left field with my choices. So um, hopefully you've been following all along, but if you're just joining us, this is the Almost Hound's Tooth quilt pattern, and uh, you can get this pattern for free as part of our Stash Busters program at sparrowquiltco.com. Just read on the front page there. It will give you directions on how you can also download this pattern. Are we still just on the other camera? Okay, so I'm going to do a uh, lead gray bobbin. It is a little bit darker than my backing fabric, but that'll be nice. It'll show really well. Uh, I'm doing a heart design, so that's going to be really pretty. And I want to see it. Okay. So we're just this camera here that's closest to you? Okay. So. These bobbins that we're using are called uh, MagnaGlide pre-wound bobbins, and they have a magnetic center. And um, what we do is put the magnet to the inside of the bobbin case, and that helps control our tension really, really well. We very, very rarely have any tension issues uh, on these machines because of the pairing of the glide top thread and the Magna Glide bobbins, it just works so beautifully. And if you are a beginner long arm quilter or know of one and they're struggling with thread and tension, give them the suggestion of glide thread with the Magna Glide bobbins. It just, it's free of frustration and it just allows you to enjoy the process, which um, that's probably the reason we got a long arm in the first place is so that you could enjoy the quilting rather than struggling under your domestic machine. I'm just going to go ahead and pop that in there. 
hear the click so I know it's in there correctly. Now I'm just going to go into the back side of the machine and tie this thread on. I just tie the new thread onto the old thread and yank it through and it's kind of saves us a lot of trouble with the threading. Landon is going to assist me here. Now just a reminder again guys, I hope you've already shared the video. Uh, if you haven't, go ahead and share it. The prize today is long arm quilting for you and a friend. So you're going to share the video and you're going to tag your friend in that post. And then you will both win uh, long arm quilting services, which is a really good thing. Let's get some of those quilts finished up that y'all were uh, listing earlier. Where do they keep them up here? There's a little post back here that I keep my snips on. Now I'm going to baste the outer edges to make sure that everything stays in place and um, then we'll bring in one of the guys to help us get the pattern set up. So I always begin by dropping my needle and bringing up my bobbin. It's um, really good to um, prevent thread from hanging off the bottom side of the quilt. You may not be able to see, but the machine uh, rides on a carriage and there's wheels on the machine and then the carriage itself glides on ball bearings. But we don't want our threads to get tangled in the wheels. Uh, that's happened to me in the past. And what happens is, you know, you're just about to execute the most perfect feather ever. And then those threads kind of throw you off track and it makes your design wiggle. And then you're, you know, cursing and being a pirate. And, uh, that's not why we want to quilt. We don't want to be frustrated. So if we keep all of our threads up at the surface, then we can control um, that type of thing from happening. I'm going to do a couple of tiny locking stitches. I just go back and forth, moving the machine a hair. And I always start with my needle down, and that holds my spot. You guys have heard me mention that a lot when I'm piecing on the domestic machine. It just holds my spot for me. So if I have to stop at any point in time, the needle is down, and the machine, um, it's easier to pick back up if you know exactly where you left off. So now I'm just going to come down this outer edge of the quilt um, with my basting stitches. Say that one more time. All right, here I come down the side and my goal is to keep the outer edge of the hopping foot lined up with the outer edge of the quilt. Okay, turn the machine off and then I'm gonna lock that again. Oh yeah, that thread is just right. It looks so good. Well, if you're just joining us, um, we are quilting up the almost houndstooth quilt today. We are upstairs in the long arm lounge and um, I've just loaded up the almost houndstooth quilt. And today we are going to quilt it with the computerized system. So I'm doing all the uh, prep work and then next we will get the pattern all set up and uh, let the computer take over from there. You'll notice that I'm kind of manipulating the fabric as I go. And I'm just making sure that everything stays nice and flat. If I push down to the left, everything on the right lays flat for me. And that way I don't get any uh, bumps or lumps that I have to try and deal with. All right, now I'll change direction and come down the side. And that seam has kind of jumped going the wrong way, so I'm just gonna flatten it before I stitch over it. Okay, now I'm going to lock my stitches to finish this off. I always lock the beginning and end when I'm long arming because I don't want those quilting stitches to come out 
it's not as crucial in the basting that will be hidden in my binding at the end. Binding. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Perhaps I'll get someone to bind this. So that we can officially consider it finished. All right. So this looks terrific. It is all ready to go. And there's always threads to trim. Always, always. I'm excited about these open areas and the design we're going to be putting on here. They're going to show really well in there. So when you are quilting, do you typically use the same thread top and bottom? You've probably noticed that I've got two different colors going here today, but I mentioned how our tension is usually like 100%. There's the odd time where something uh, maybe the bobbin wasn't loaded correctly, and then we end up with a little bit of a tension issue. But uh, for the most part, we can safely use a different color, top and bottom. It's the machine I'm using today. The question is, what machine am I using? Uh, today we're using the APQS Lucy. And APQS stands for American Professional Quilting Systems. And Lucy is a 26-inch throat machine. And she is the lightest of the 26 inch machines. She's my favorite. I really like her for doing free motion quilting. The weight of her is just really nice and uh, she's easy to use. My preference is to put her on what's called a deluxe table so that I've got that motorized advance that I was telling you about earlier. Um, so then I've got the nice light weight of a Lucy but all the um, advantages of the upgraded table. So yeah, you cannot see it. We've got two other machines going over here. Uh, we've got a couple of renters finishing some quilts. And I've got yet a fourth machine behind me over here. There's a customer quilt loaded on that. I'm not sure if you can see any of that, but um, yeah, we've got four long arms going here. And that keeps us pretty busy. The two machines for customer quilts and then the two machines for renters. Any questions or anything else, Elle, before we proceed? <laughs> yes, yes, I suppose we could. <laughs> you could l roll your quilt tops onto this roller if you wanted to. I like to see what's coming. Um, yeah, that's just our preference. Uh, and it seems kind of silly to roll the whole quilt top on here and get all the threads and everything rolled onto itself again. Um, I don't know, I just like floating better. It really does have its advantages. Okay, so we are ready to start getting this thing going. Oh, dust. She's plugged in. Hmm? Oh, there we go. I just held down the power button and it is coming back on. So this is just a Windows Surface Pro tablet. It comes with the Quilt Path. Quilt Path is uh, the computerized portion of the uh, quilting machine. And that's an add-on that you can add to any of the APQS machines. And that allows us... Ah. <laughs> How long does it take to do a queen-size quilt? A queen-size quilt I would factor about a day. Um... Depends on how tight the pattern is and uh, how focused you are as a person. But yeah, we usually factor four to five hours at least. If we're doing it computerized, it can sometimes take a little bit longer. When you're manually driving the machine, you can go as fast as you want. With the quilt path, we usually kind of set the, ste the speed to be kind of moderate, not um, crazy fast. Okay. So I'm just... Pardon? Oh, my quilt size today is 66 inches square. So if you download this pattern and make it, you will find that it is a nice, good size. 
but it's not huge and you can do it fairly quickly. And another great thing about this pattern is that you can use up some of your prints that have maybe a larger scale to them because the blocks are a little bit bigger so you can show them off a little bit more. Okay, so there's two belts with quilt path, one that runs on the vertical and the other one that runs on the horizontal. I need to make sure those belts are engaged, otherwise the machine won't be able to move by itself. Those belts are engaged and it's asking me to move to the center of my quilting space. So that's about there and I'm gonna hit okay. So the machine just kind of shook it was the computer taking charge of it. It has now got control of the machine. The system is just kind of booting up here. And we are gonna be doing what's called a pantograph. So it'll be like an edge to edge type of design. At this point, I am going to wave my little white flag and I am going to have one of the fellas come over here and start helping me. I'll just wait a second here. Dylan's helping Colleen, the renter, and my brother has run downstairs. Um, I'm going to set this up so we can show them. This. Cool. Okay. And then we'll give Dylan the mic. Okay, good idea. That's a good idea. And then maybe I can run downstairs and start organizing my diagonal piecing, and we'll just let Dylan stream for a little bit up here. Just about. Yeah, like I've got it ready. Whenever you're ready, I'm ready for you to come over. So Landon is just rearranging the camera so that you guys are going to be able to see what's happening on the screen here. And that gives you sort of a insight as to how we run the computerized system here. And by we, I mean those two smart young men over there. It's actually really cool to watch the screen because you can see the progress of the design and um, actually watch the computer quilting. You need it? There we go. Sometimes if a backing's a little bit wrinkly, we can spray it with some water while we're loading it up and then that softens the wrinkles and keeping it nice and taut will flatten out the wrinkles while it's on the frame. And then again, we don't have to worry about those pleats, tucks or wrinkles in our backing fabric. Because no one likes to turn their quilt over and find a pleat or a tuck. It just kind of, it's disappointing. It's hardly the end of the world. And if it does ever happen to you, uh, wash your quilt. If you have not pre-washed the shrinkage, we'll sometimes get rid of that um, little bit of pleating or wrinkling. Nice. So like I said before, we're going to be doing a design called uh, Pieces of My Heart, and it is a nice uh, heart type of design, which suits this quilt because this quilt has got little hearts in it and little Cupid's arrows, and it's just kind of cutesy, so a heart design seems fitting, especially with today being Valentine's Day. Are any of you working on this quilt? Have any of you started it? I got a couple of uh, emails over the past few days of people who have finished it, and um, I'll be sharing one a little bit later today. One of our uh, very avid quilters, her name is Susan. She lives just east of the city, and she has made all my patterns. So just a shout out to Susan. She is such a um, enthusiastic quilter, and she sends me the sweetest messages. So I'm just grateful for you, Susan. I'm not sure if you're watching this right now, but if you get to see this later, just a thank you to you for your enthusiasm and your support. I really adore you and I'm grateful for you. Sure, yeah, we can do that. So I'm just going to hand the mic over to uh, Dylan here and then I'll go over and help Colleen get going. And then Dylan can, uh, you guys start setting up the pattern and stuff.
Mike is on. Hello, everybody. Which camera is looking at me? Um, we're on the back one. The one behind me? Yeah. All right. So, first thing we're going to do, we are going to open up Pantograph and create and design. It's the only thing I ever choose. I never choose anything else. It's just a, a safe bet to go with. So, am I ready? Okay, so I'm going to click on Pantograph. It's going to tell me to mark my top left, bottom right of my quiltable space. This isn't my quilt size. This is just the quiltable space altogether. So, I'm going to come over here. And, of course, I'm way past my quilt, but this is the quiltable space. Bottom right, I'm going to come back over here. Again, come down to this certain point. What I like to do at this point, I like to come up a little bit. I move it up a couple of inches because back here is where it hits. Once you have more of your quilt rolling up on here, the thicker it is, the farther away your line is. So sometimes quilt pad doesn't know that your quiltable space is no longer your quiltable space because of it rolling up onto this roller. So I just, I pull it a couple of inches away from it so that as it rolls up, I still have all of the quiltable space I want. So bottom right. And now we are ready. I know the pattern is going to be pieces of my heart. The very first thing I press is the easy. I want more options than this. So I put it to basic and you can see I've got a lot more options. Now I'm going to pick my pattern, just pieces of my heart. Stay with me, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> there we go. Pieces of my heart, open it up, there it is. That's one solid, that's one pattern. Down here, actually, sorry, tape measure. At this point here, in here, is where I'm going to put these two bottom ones. This is my total width and total height of my quilt size. So what I'm going to do, I measure it. I'm going to put it at about 67.5. And now it's broken. Am I still live on the mic? No? No, oh, I am? All right, sorry about the uh, the freeze frame, guys. Bear with us. Yeah. Back on track. All right. Give us one second. I'm live. Okay, <laughs> I'm good to go. So, when I print this out, I want to keep this proportion. I want, if I have a perfect circle somewhere, I want to make sure it stays a perfect circle. So I measure what it is on paper, and then I stretch it to, to match, so the closest I can have, you know, to the right, uh, to the proper proportions I like would be 20 by 11. This is what it is on paper. It's 10 by 5.5. 5.5 high isn't very high. It's going to be really dense if I leave it like that. So I'm just, I just double them up. Sometimes I can only do a quarter of it, not half. So, so I put my total height, my total width in there. After this, I'm just going to start adding rows. So my pattern width, I want 20. 20 wide, so 22.5 or 16. 
Sorry, let me try that again. 23 or 17.8? I don't want to go 23. I don't really want to go over 11. Right? So if I went 23, I'd have to make this about 13. And I don't like that. That's too big for me. So I'm going to make it 17.8 instead of 20. Which means this is going to be slightly smaller too. So I'm going to start adding rows until I get under 11. So right now it's at 8.3. So if I change this to let's say 10, because I want it to be smaller than 11, you can see it didn't stretch it enough to, to fit like it's supposed to. So I'm going to add another row, make my pattern height 10 again, and you can see it got in a lot closer. When I zoom in on it, you can see how it looks. All right, so I'm always looking up here as well, trying to make sure that I've got it at the right spot. Right, I'm looking kind of at this one here. It's kind of parallel with that, that point. So I, I think that's pretty good. Right. If I hit fit button, what will happen is up at the top, it puts the partial in. You can kind of see it there. Once I hit that fit off, it's no longer there. It doesn't fill in the opening. So when I hit fit, it fills in the opening. Right. So that point there, I like it. 17 by 10, I've got 20 by 11. Right, But I, I, I don't want to go to 23 by 13. So... That's my safer bet. You can see the proportions, the hearts, they look like hearts, they're not stretched too much, they're not too wide. All right, so at this point here, we're going to just hit quilt as rows. Once you have this all set up, you hit quilt as rows. If you hit a quilt as a single pattern, it'll want to do more than just one row. It's always better to keep your quilt straight and everything to if you do quilt as rows. Alright, at this point here, I'll probably need you landed. Okay. Just because I'm going to move the machine again. Okay, so at this point here, what I got to do, I got to mark, I normally go with my center. I never go with my sides. I always go with my center. It keeps my pattern straight. So I find center. I know it's somewhere around there. I'm actually going to just back this off a bit. All right, so I know that's my center or my pattern. I always measure anyways. So from one side over, I've got 33. The other side over, I've got just under 33. So I'm just going to kind of tuck it over just a little bit. So I like that. Once I hit my top center, it's going to move that pattern. Okay, it's too high. That's all right. Easy fix. All right, so that red line is basically telling me that my quilt, my pattern is outside of the safe area that I set at the very beginning when I went way over to the left, way over to the right. All I had to do was advance backwards, bring that quilt down a little bit. And now when I do that again, it should fit now. So once I've got this and it's no longer red, I know I'm in my quiltable space. First thing I'd like to do at this point, every single one of these blue dots is going to be a lock stitch. It's going to do a lock stitch, it's going to move, do another lock stitch, and then continue. What I like to do is go up to optimize, go to remove all of the lock stitches. Do I want to connect the first point to the last point? No. Because if I hit yes, it's going to sew the straight line all the way across. That isn't what we want. So I'll do it again, optimize, remove all. Click no, and you can see it got rid of all of our trim lines up at the top, on the sides. It's just going to keep going. It's not going to stop and do lock stitches all over. Hit OK. So at this point here, I hit pull bobbin, and it's going to move itself into the start spot where it knows the bobbin needs to be pulled. Doing good on time? Can you tell them that we're going to show it stitching 
Okay. Yeah, so for the first part here, we're going to just show you on the up close. We're going to show you the first part here. I'm um, just so you can kind of see the pattern, see how it stitches, stuff like that. And then we're going to go to the other camera and you'll get the side view. Um, so this point here, pulling my bobbin. I always check my bobbin. I always give it a pull. Right? You never know. If you accidentally put that bobbin in with the thread behind it, when you go to pull, it's going to seize on you instantly. It's a, you know, give it a good pull, and that way you know that uh, it's not seized on you. Always have your top thread pull harder than your bobbin. Sorry, I teach students, so I uh, <laughs> sometimes I just teach. <laughs> All right, pulling my bobbin. It's a little bit different when you're uh, when you're renting one of the machines. Um, you're able to move the machine. Normally, you drop the needle, move the machine, pull your bobbin that way. Because my machine is locked on by the motor, I have to grab my top thread with both hands, go under my hopping foot, and then I can pull my bobbin like that. I could use the machine itself to hit, you know, to make it do it itself, but it takes a little bit longer, and this is just really fast. So once I have them both. I won't do the lock stitch. I will hit sew. The machine will do a lock stitch for me and then take off. So I'm going to hit sew at this point. I'm just going to hold on to my threads, let it do its lock stitch. And then once it starts going, there's a nice thread color. Had a little thread break, so re-threading the machine. It's good that it happened off the bat. Don't know where my scissors are. One second. Well, I get to show you a lock stitch. So, what I like to do, I like to pull on my bobbin, cut my top thread, cut my bobbin thread. There's no loose thread at this stitch where it broke. There's no thread hanging underneath. There's no thread hanging on top. That's how you can hide your lock stitch really well. So again, pull on my top thread. Okay, it's not seized. I'm going to pull my bobbin out. It's not seized either. And that explains that. All right. So right here, just re-threading the needle, make sure it's all my guides, I'm still good to go, okay. Repair pattern, and then I'm going to go trace back. And it's going to trace back to where the stitch broke. Okay. I, as you can see, I've, I got about a half inch. I like to pull my bobbin on the old stitch. Hold on to them both. Do a nice lock stitch right there. I have to manually move it because my, just the fabric itself, because my machine's stuck in one spot. So once I have my lock stitch and bring my needle back up, I'm going to hit sew again. And then I'm just going to let it continue on, cut those threads off. And now we're back going again.
So I like to just kind of get my hand in there when I get to all my bulky seams, just to make sure it doesn't push the seam out of the way. I want it to ride over that seam. So you can see here, you can see a tiny little bit of gray, just a tiny little bit. That means our top tension is pulling the bobbin up to the top just a little bit. So all I'm going to do, I'm just going to loosen this off just a hair. And now we'll see that, you know, that dark gray is gone from those points. It's very mild stuff like that. We'll normally just push back when the batting, you know, uh, once it relaxes. Of course, when you're rent when you're renting or when you're standing at the back doing a pantograph, you can't exactly be in there to hold all your play and stuff like that. So it's a good thing that when you're basting, get as close to the border as you can, so you don't have to watch for the folding that that happens. But this is a very nice flat quilt, so it's uh, there's not a whole lot of play to to watch out for. Oh, no, it's all good. It's so one thing to keep in mind, too, when you're running the computer. Hitting these buttons is a no-no. This stop button will stop quilt path. Quilt path and the computer, the, the head itself are on two different circuits. So if you lose power to your head, quilt path will stay engaged, quilt path will still move. So you never really want to just leave. Right? I, I know some people want to just walk away from it. You can for a couple minutes. Don't walk away the whole row because if anything happens, it's going to keep going. I, I don't myself don't use the thread brake sensor. If I did and something was to happen, it would shut off for me. But because I'm here all the time, I just don't use it. So it is optional. You can you can walk away, but it's a machine. So it's a stop button, not the button down here. I normally the only time I'll touch these is when I'm pulling my bottom and doing my basting. So if ever you have any issues, something happens, you always just want to hit that stop button up on the screen, not the buttons on the handle. Um, yes and no. Sometimes I'll I'll reach for the handle and I'll I'm almost forgetting that it's uh, that I can't push the buttons themselves. But what I end up doing is I just hold on to that machine and don't let it move and then hit the stop button. Um, that's kind of my own mistake. I can just hit the stop button and it's a lot easier. <laughs> but sometimes you forget. Even I forget. Years in and years in, and it's. Uh, it's okay to forget sometimes. So I hit the button. That's basically uh, it, all it said was that I finished my row. Um, so at this point here, I can move my machine again. I'm just going to pull my bobbin to cut it free. Just like that. 
I'm going to hit OK. It just says, you know, your next row has been placed. If it's if it needs to be advanced, it'll be down here at the bottom and it'll be highlighted in the red. All right. And it's also going to tell you that you need to advance. it. So at this point here, again, I don't want those giant lock stitches. I'm going to optimize, remove all. Hit OK. Now they're all gone. I'll hit pull bobbin. Yes, I could have moved the machine over here and then hit pull bobbin. Um, I'm just normally really busy, so I'm just used to hitting that button and let it move on its own so I can do other things. But, again, hold that top thread. I'm going to pull my bobbin manually again, and I'm just going to hit sew. And it's just going to do that partial, the little filler that we put in there at the beginning. I hope you all can hear me loud and clear. I know I don't speak the loudest sometimes. Finish the next row. Move my machine now. If I don't hit finish the next row, I won't be able to move my machine. Holding onto the thread, there's my bobbin. At this point here, your bobbin tail is as long as, as far as your machine is. So the farther away you move your machine, the longer your bobbin tail is gonna be. If you only move it an inch, that's how much bobbin tail you're gonna have. So I'm gonna, so at this point here, it's telling me that it's not in the safe zone anymore. Can you see this from behind me? Or is it this one now? Okay. Um, yeah, it's advancing. I think it would be helpful. No problem. So we're just trying to get the camera on behind us here. Show you how to advance. All right, so at this point here, you can see it's outside of the safe zone. It says here instead of, you know, uh, pull bobbin and all, you know, sometimes it's here. But what you're going to do is you're going to hit move to top center. The machine's going to move to top center for us of the next row. And I'm just going to reach behind you. Some people use a pen. Some people use a little marker. I myself use a piece of tape. I stick that piece of tape under here. When the machine stops, it's in the top center of my next row. I'm gonna drop my needle. That's my mark. So now I'm just going to advance. I have a little habit of pulling my my backing and my top together, never pull your side harder than you pull your center because this will stretch a lot more than everything else. So I just pull them consistently. At the same time, I'm looking at the gaps and I'm just trying to make sure that these lines stay straight. The straighter I keep the quilt, the more confident I feel when I finish that quilt. So, okay, it's already basted down all the way first so I don't have to baste again. What I do have to hit, right now my machine's locked. It moved to top center, I marked it, but it's still locked. I'm gonna hit continue with placement. Are you sure you marked your fabric? Yes, I am. And now I'm just gonna come back up to that hole. I'm not gonna drop the needle again, but I am just gonna get it of the needle above that hole. I'm gonna hit my mark center, and you can see it brought that pattern up again. Now it's back in the safe zone.
You can see the little lock stitch over here it wants to do. I don't like that. And now it's gone. Try to remember to optimize every row. It is especially the top and the bottom. That's where all the lock stitches happen. So, okay. And at this point here, we're going to hit pull bobbin. It's going to move itself to the beginning of the next row again. Now again, holding that top thread, needle down, needle up. My machines can't move under the hopping foot, just with my top thread, and there's my bobbin. I always pull it until I only have one. Sometimes I got a nice long bobbin tail. I don't want multiple threads in that hole. I just want, you know, the one bobbin tail coming out. So once I have them, I can hit sew. It's going to put that lock stitch in for me. And then it's going to take off. Now, I know some of you are always like, oh, is he going to get his finger stuck? The thing is, I cannot get my finger under that hopping foot. <laughs> right? I cannot. It'll push my finger out of the way. The only thing I get, is sometimes I get nicked on that little screw right there. <laughs> but I'm a guy. I'm used to it. I don't mind having rough hands. <laughs> Now, knowing, too, that this next row, this quilt's laying really flat, I don't have to worry about the folds happening up at the top. So I can just kind of leave this alone, and it will do this entire row. I don't have to work play in. I don't have to watch any scenes, anything like that. It's just it light, it's lying nice and flat. Not quite sure what to say at this point. It uh, <laughs> it kind of just does its own thing. Um, it's lots of fun. I my favorite thing about this is picking the thread color and and designing the pattern to make it fit the quilt. I don't know why that's I like doing that, but you know that's it's one of my favorite things to do. You guys okay? Yeah, okay. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. I forgot when I left the house, I'm going to have to apologize and get my wife some chocolates or something because I forgot. Thank God she doesn't watch this. <laughs> Question. You don't need to. Normally, I'll turn around. I'll be working on this one as well at the same time. Um, you know, I could go make coffee at this point. Uh, but, you know, um, we're kind of filming. 
but yeah, for the most part, if there's if there's no play in it and it's lying nice and flat, you can definitely walk away. When you have, uh, let's say, uh, panels and there's play inside those panels, but the borders around the panels are nice and tight, that play, you have to work that play in because it's going to bunch up against one side and that's where that all that play is going to build up. So, you know, you kind of want to be there to work play in if you have a really wonky quilt. Um, not everybody's a perfect piecer. Um, so, you know, it's uh, it all depends on the quilt itself. But no, you don't necessarily have to stay with the quilt. I also uh, supervise renters here too, so uh, you know, while my machines are going, I'm over there helping them as well. I've, I've got a pretty good ear when it comes to thread breaks, so I, I can kind of hear when there's an issue, when there's no thread in the machine. You know, you can hear a little bit more vibration in the hook assembly. You can hear a little bit more of a rattle when your bobbin's low as well. It's a good indication for when you're running low on your bobbin. If you start hearing it over here, take a look before you start your next row. Because there's a good chance you're not going to make that next row. Sometimes it's just a dirty hook assembly. But finish the next row. Pull my bobbin. Cut it free. Move to top center. It's going to move down here somewhere. And I'm going to have to put that tape back under. Marked it. I'm going to hit continue with placement. I'm going to advance. And again, I do this every time I advance. It's a good way to keep that quilt top straight because if I ever had to shift it like this because of the... You know, I'm following every seam I can. I'm looking at the ones coming down like this, keeping my quilt straight. That seam wants to know if that machine tells you the bobbin sensor. So Lucy doesn't have a thread break sensor. However, when you buy Quilt Path, it comes with a thread break sensor that gets attached right here. I personally, I just don't use it. Um, you know, and I'm always here with my machines. I've got a good ear for it too. This one here, however, does have my thread brake sensor if I use it. Um, this, the, it's, a, it's basically just a little disc. The thing is, if you're not going through that disc and you have your thread brake sensor turned on, it's going to alert you as it's, the machine starts moving. It's going to want to stop every time because you're not actually through that disc. Um, I, it's, it's kind of just a personal preference for me. I just decided not to. Um, but definitely there are thread brake sensors that come with quilt path so that you would attach it. Um, and then it would, uh, basically if the top thread stops spinning that wheel, your machine will stop. Quilt path will stop knowing that there's a thread brake. My machines right now, because I'm not using that, they won't stop if I have a thread brake. That's kind of all on me. So I've got room to base this time, so I'm going to base coming down. One thing to keep in mind is you always apply pressure behind as you're basting. Keeps your quilt top nice and straight. If you're pushing play down and the machine's pushing play down, your quilt could end up a little twisted when you get to the bottom, a little bit bowed on your corners just because the sides will always stretch more than the center. Yes, I throw thread on the floor a lot. My garbage is at the one side of the machine, and uh, I don't use it very often. So try not to do this. A lot of people try to stretch that out and try to, you know, keep their hand way up here and base all the way down. Try not to do that. Um, having your hand way up here is absolutely doing nothing down here for all that play. So... One thing you'll notice too on every one of my quilts, I cut off 
all my threads. I have no loose threads sitting at the top, none on the bottom, right? I do this so that I don't get, uh, doesn't get tangled up. Because if it gets caught in it where your machine's quilting and it gets entangled, all of a sudden you're going to get a bunch of skip stitches and right just because it's pulling all that fabric and it's just no good. So again, mark my center, my top center, brought my pattern up. I'm going to optimize again to get rid of my lock stitch and then it's going to move to the start spot again. So I, we've got clamps. I use clamps sometimes, um, depending on whether my backing is pieced in the center coming top to bottom, right? Your sides will always want to be a little droopy. So I, I sometimes use clamps for that. Um, if I have a lot of wrinkles and stuff like that in the backing, sometimes putting the clamps on, you know, we'll get rid of those. Um, you can always iron too. So again... So I've done about two rows. I'm actually going to check my bobbin at this point. So you can see it's still almost full. You'd be surprised though. Half of that bobbin is actually a lot less than half of that bobbin. Um, so it's... Uh, now that I know I've got enough for this row, every single row after this, I constantly check my bobbin. I don't assume I can do a couple more. I just, I'll check my bobbin again after this row. And... Replace it if I need to. I don't like having lock stitches throughout my quilt because I let my bobbin run out. So again, I'm just going to watch on the sides here. Had a thread break. Kind of saw it in my eye, at the corner of my eye. Again, pull my bobbin, make sure it didn't seize, it's okay. Take a look at my top thread again. So pulling on it, it's not seized either. All right, it's just one of those things. So again, I'm going to, I, I get my bobbin up to the top. Just like that, and then all I hold, I hold on to my bobbin thread, and I cut my top thread, and then I cut the bobbin. Again, there's no loose thread anywhere there. That thread ends right at that stitch. So again, I can't move my machine. So I'm going to hit repair pattern, trace back, let it come back to about this point, about a half inch onto the old row. Drop my needle, pull my bobbin again there. Gonna hit so. Let it sew over that old line. And then we're back on track.
So I'm sticking the pin in here. I had another thread break, but what it was was a fray in the thread that snapped under tension and it continued to stitch. So it's still stitching. The stitches look great. Tension still looks good. It's just I have a break from about that far right here. And that's, uh, that was just braying my thread that, you know, when it gets under tension, it gets a couple more stitches, but then breaks free on you. If it continues to stitch, it was a fray on your thread. If it was a, just a normal break, it would just, it would continue to, to sew again. So I'll come back and I'll fix that little spot afterwards. No point in me stopping it when it's self going. If it breaks again, I'm going to stop and I'll pick back. But for the most part, I don't know if you guys heard all that vibrating and stuff. I will take this off. It's right under the mic. 